All right, we might as well get started. I hope everyone is doing well this, I'm not sure, this is not the morning anymore, this late morning. Um, so look, today uh, we're gonna do uh, two things, but the primary objective today is to expose you guys to how we value flexibility in uh, corporate projects using the static replication uh, based derivative valuation techniques that we covered last week, right? So that's the material that was found in the YouTube video that I posted. Uh, so hopefully folks that are here have viewed that video already. Um, if you have not, uh, unless you're pretty comfortable with that stuff from a derivatives course, this would probably not be this uh, that useful of a lecture to attend live, to be honest. Um, but I'll work under the assumption that everyone saw that basic video. We're actually going to repeat the exercise where I try to lay it out again, maybe in a slightly different way, um, so that if folks weren't perfectly clear on things, maybe me saying it slightly differently is incrementally helpful. So we're gonna do that first, so that before we start talking about corporate projects, what type of flexibility we have in that, and how we use this technique to value that corporate flexibility, we'll first just do another recap, little mini quick-ish example of um, static replication on a hypothetical derivative security. I say hypothetical, so I'm going to write, I'm going to jot down a random payoff diagram, and we're just going to procedurally go through the replication, then valuation aspect of, uh, of that derivative. Sound good? All right, good. Let's go ahead and do that. Um, well, you guys can see me in big, correct? Okay. So um, remember, um, look, what, what is our goal here? The, the fundamental goal is that we want to learn how to value a specific derivative security, right? Figure out how do we, you know, what is the worth of this complicated looking security, right? Um, and first question is what defines the security? So this whole business of talking about payoff diagrams that was the core of everything we did in our last lecture. That's all about what is the definition of this security. The definition of the security from a financial standpoint is how much money it pays off in different states of the world, right? Um, and with a derivative security, and in particular, derivative securities that are European in nature, so that means they can only be exercised at the end of the life of the option, not anywhere before that. If you can, if you can choose the timing of it all, it's called an American style derivative, right? So here we're just focusing on European style. Uh, why is it called European versus American? I don't know. Um, I want to know what's Canadian, but that's okay. I'll, uh, I'm sure we can ask Google about that. Um, so what is a payoff diagram? A payoff diagram it essentially defines the security for us. And on the y-axis, it's the payoff of this specific derivative of derivative. And because it's a European style derivative, that payoff only happens in the future at a specific date called the maturity date of the derivative. So I'll just say at T, where big T is my notation for maturity. The X axis is the um, value at that same point in time, the maturity date T, of the underlying asset. Value of underlying at that same point in time T. Look, the reason why it's called a derivative is that the payoff of this is derivative of the underlying, so that it is a function of the underlying. How valuable the underlying is determines how, how much of a payoff the derivative gives you, right? So it's not about like, you know, 
calculus. It's about, you know, derivative as in like, you know, a, a, a points to B in some sort of way, you know. And we're assuming here that the only thing that matters for this is this, right? And so as a result, when we draw a payoff diagram for a derivative, we are defining that derivative, okay? So I'll pick a random one. Uh, it starts at 10 and then all the way up to 10, goes up to 15, then, then at 10, it falls to, to five. So this is a slope zero to 10, it goes up five. So that's a slope, slope equals to 0 0.5. This is a slope of zero. And then let's assume um, jumps back up to 10 at 20, and then has a slope uh, thereafter of one. And this is, so this is a jump equal to five, and this was a drop equal to 10. Folks, okay, look, I've just literally drawn a gen, like it's just a random payoff diagram that falls into the class of piecewise linear with jumps or drops. That's, that's like the nerdy way of classifying what this, like which family this is a member of, right? Um, so now that's always step one. This is like the payoff diagram is, is what tells you what this is. And now that we understand what this is, we want to figure out what is this worth? Okay. And the strategy, my strategy for this, and this is the essence of static replication. My goal is to figure out a different way to get the same payoff diagram, which consists of different raw ingredients. Remember the raw ingredients are what? Zero coupon bond, underlying asset, and then calls and CNBCs. CNBC is a cash or nothing binary call in the underlying asset. So those are my raw ingredients. It's my, uh, like, I think there's like a Malcolm Gladwell book where he talks about the different tastes. There's like salt, sugar, sour, like uh, maybe it's bitter, I don't know. And there's like umami, right? Those are like the like five principal fundamental flavors or something. So anything that you taste can be viewed as a, some combination of those things, right? We're gonna figure out, this is a combination of what fundamental things? What combination of zero coupon bond, underlying, calls and CNBCs, right? Maybe another way to think about this is look, the, my strategy here, it's not my strategy, but the, this strategy, static replication, basically the logic of the exercise is the following. It's like if you go to a restaurant and you order a dish, you, you're brought this dish, you taste it, you're like, man, this is such good stuff. I wanna make this at home. And so you like very mindfully try to like decipher everything that's in the dish. You're like, okay, well, you know, there's pasta, there's some veal, there's some uh, uh, anchovy, there's some uh, chiote paste, who knows, right? Like a bunch of things, right? Um, it's a very confusing dish because I just brought in ingredients from like Mexico and Italy, but like in any case. Um, whatever, right? You've got your list of ingredients and you try to buy, and, and you're trying to get a sense of the recipe, right? And you want to figure out what is the value of this dish? Well, once you have the recipe, what do you do, right? You can go to like the IGA, go down like the different aisles and figure out like, well, what is, how much does it cost for this pasta? How much does it cost for, well, there's no way you can get achiote paste at the IGA, but let's assume it's the super IGA. Uh, you know, what, what, how much is achiote paste? so on and so forth. And then you have like, okay, well, I need this much of this and it costs this much per unit, this much of that costs that much per unit. And then you know what the value of the thing, it's just the value of a shopping cart. Price times quantity plus price times quantity plus price times quantity, finished. 
And now you know, okay, well, you know, this dish in terms of the ingredients costs, you know, um, $7 and 44 cents. Uh, it costed $34 at the, at the restaurant. Oh, I can actually kind of figure out the margins now. Um, um, stuff like that. Right. Um, but literally what we are doing here is the same. It's logically the same thing, right? This is looking at the dish, really understanding it and translating it into a recipe. That's, that's my, like when I lay out the replicating portfolio, that is doing that. And then we look at all the ingredients in the replicating portfolio and we're gonna use the Black-Scholes model to figure out the price of all the ingredients. So, you know, I talked about go to the super IGA. Well, we're gonna go to the super black Scholes model. That's like our grocery store in this class. And by the way, I give you guys on my courses a template that makes it easier for you to go to the grocery store. You don't have to go push a cart and figure out, well, what is this call option worth? What is that call option? It's like a little bit faster. It's like you can, you can do it from home, you know, in your pajamas kind of thing. Um, but that's the second part. When we use the Black-Scholes model, it's just us going to the super IGA. And then the final step is the easiest part, price times quantity plus price times quantity plus price times quantity, and then we're done. That is the procedure, okay? So let's go ahead and highlight this here. Sound good? So our first step, remember, is to go from this Think of this as the flavor profile to like, uh, um, like our guess of the recipe that we've jotted down on a napkin, right? So that's what we're doing now. And remember, what I told you is there's that, actually it's really difficult to do this with food. I mean, fine, like our vision can help us quite a bit, but actually figuring it out to the T is super hard. But here it's actually super easy once we see this. Because what I told you guys last lecture is we replicate from left to right. And in order to match the intercept, right, this initial level of 10, there's only one thing that we can use. It's the zero coupon bond that matures at this point in time. How do we match the original slope of 0 0.5? There's only one way for us to do that. We use the underline. How do we match a drop? We short the CNBC. How do we match a change in slope? We use the call option. Simple as that. Everything that can happen in a piecewise linear with jumps, everything that happens has only one way to match it. So that once you've drawn this, the thing that's actually really difficult if you were trying to do in a restaurant is actually rather easy. So let's go ahead and do that. Right? Our replicating is called, right? The nerdy. Finance professor language for this is replicating portfolio, but that's just literally the recipe. All right. So first ingredient, first ingredient, we're going left to right. We're matching 10. How do we do that? We go long. Long means we buy because it's positive instead of negative. We go long 10 in face value of riskless zero coupon bond to RZC in my thing here is just me shortening riskless zero coupon bond with maturity equal to time t because we need to make sure we get ten dollars at time t what about our second ingredient we're matching the original slope of 0.5 right so we go long 0 0.5 units of underline, which I will denote later on by this U. Now, in the real world, the underlying might be something like a stock, 
it might be a currency, it might be a commodity, right? You have all of, I mean, there's so many of these things created in the real world. Uh, they don't look like that though. I kind of, you know, bullshit made up this one. You know? So far so good, we've matched this all the way up to this. Now, once we get to a strike to a level of 10 for the underlying value of the company, well, we know two things happen. There's a drop of 10, but there's also a change in slope from 0.5 to zero. So notice there is two things happening at 10, right? So we're gonna add a third and a fourth ingredient. I'll match the drop first, then I'll match the change in slope. So to match the drop, it's a drop of 10, so we go short. It's a negative position, 10 units, a drop CNBC of CNBC on underline with the strike price of 10 and the maturity T. And then the fourth ingredient is about taking a slope of 0.5 and popping it down to zero. So how do we make a slope fall by 0.5? We go short 0.5 call options. Short 0.5 units of call on same underline with still a strike price of 10 and a maturity equal to T. Now we are matched here and all the way here. And so all we need to do is go from this to this. And that happens when? At 20. So at 20, we need to match a jump of five and an increase in slope from zero to one. Two things. So we're gonna have ingredient five and ingredient six. So ingredient five is long five units of CNBC on underline with K equals to 20 because the jump happens at 20 and still maturity equals to T. By the way, the maturity for everything that has a maturity will all be the same because all of this stuff is happening at the same point in time. And then the final thing to match the increase in slope is we're gonna go long one unit of call on U with K equals 20 and maturity equals T. We now have the recipe that we go to the, you know, if it was food, it was super IGA. It's not food, so it's super Black Scholes model land. We good with this? So if we knew the price of all of these six ingredients, do we agree that getting the value of this thing would be pretty straightforward, right? If this thing has a price equal to P1, it would be 10, well, no, it's one unit of the 10 in phase. So it'd be one times the price of this bond plus 0.5 times the price of the underlying plus, no, minus 10, times the price of this CNBC minus 0.5 times the price of this call plus five times the price of this CNBC, which is different from this one, plus um, one times the price of this call option, which again is different from that call option. They're different because they have different strike prices. So when I say we use calls, it's kind of like we use the whole family of calls, right? There's millions of different calls because there's a call strike price 10, strike, strike price 10 and a quarter, strike price 10 and 50 cents. There's 10 cents. You know, I could keep on going for a long time if I wanted, right? Um, you know, it's kind of like saying mushrooms, but there's like shiitake mushrooms. There's like, you know, portobello mushrooms, et cetera, et cetera, right? So it's, uh, we use the family of mushrooms. Not all mushrooms. Don't use all mushrooms. Um, so, yeah. Um, not that I know anything about that. So, um, okay. So now let's um, do our last step. Um, or, I mean, our last um, non-trivial step. 
which is how do we go to the soup like to the to our version of the super iga right and so i've tried in this course to make this part of the exercise as easy as possible for you okay um and the way that i've done that is by on my courses giving you guys something a file that in its name has the wor words black shoals template and what i'll do right now is i'll show you guys how to use the black shoals template um how to use the black sorry how to use the black shoals template for the purposes of solving um solving this problem so i'm going to give you guys uh, some additional information that we need in order to be able to use the black shoals model here because you need to know something about the underlying asset in order to be able to use the black shoals model and so far all i've told you is there is an underlying asset right so let let me go now and tell you some key characteristics of the underlying asset okay so let's assume the underlying under like what do we know, need to know about the underlying we need to know its current price s0 and we need to know its volatility the standard deviation of its returns so let's assume its current price is 30 and its volatility is 55% per year so 55% um standard deviation of uh annual uh, stock returns sound good in addition to that we need to know what the riskless rate is because we can't figure out the price of the zero coupon riskless bond without knowing what the riskless rate is so we'll also assume that the riskless rate is let's call it two percent per year so far so good uh look it's also important for us to know what t actually is because if i told you hey someday in the future this is going to happen you'd be like jiro is this happening in a year or is this happening in a thousand years and the answer to that question would probably change how much you're willing to pay for it um you'd probably be willing to pay approximately zero for it if it was happening in a thousand years right um so that's kind of relevant right so i'm also going to tell you um t let's use t equals one one year um if this is quoted annual and if this is quoted annual you need to quote this in annual okay so you want to be consistent with your time scales everywhere um this is all we need in order to be able to to use our model now you might say hey wait a second jiro um i remember the black shoals formula and you also need to know a strike price like there's the parameter k that shows up in the formula and by the way if you don't know that because you don't know anything about the black shoals model don't sweat it uh because the template is going to be user friendly to someone who has never and cares never to see the black shoals formula okay it actually allows you to buy bypass that um but yes we're going to use strike prices but the strike prices are already in the recipe that's why i don't jot that down here are we are we okay so far so now what i'm going to do is i'm going to actually take everything we did here and i'm going to show you how you use my black shoals template to um, solve this problem and get an actual value of um the security sound good so i'm going to now share my screen you guys can see my screen all right um i tried to make by the way if you guys can come up with any ideas on how i can make this simpler i'm all ears i've tried i, I my goal is to make it as simple as humanly possible okay um and so let me show you how things work um the numbers you want to change in this template are the yellow things so anything that is not yellow do not fuck with that cell okay just <laughs> leave it be the only things you are well you're welcome to do it but then you're probably going to lose points on the final okay um so um the yellow stuff that's the only stuff you touch 
the red stuff is the only thing you need to read. Everything else is intermediate steps that you don't need to overthink. It's just me teaching Excel how to use the Black-Scholes formula, okay? So now let's talk about what all of this means. Uh, you'll notice I've labeled those columns, oops, and then, right, you've got component one, component two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So my template right now allows for up to eight ingredients in your recipe. Now, if you're worried like, oh, you know, Jiro's gonna go put like uh, 15 of them on the final and then we're gonna be screwed. Well, you know, look, what, you're, well, you're welcome to believe whatever you wanna believe. Um, if you're scared of that, you can create your own version of the template and just get yourself up to component, um, uh, component uh, 15. Uh, it's not that difficult. It's just gonna be a lot of drag formulas to the right. Okay, so um, um, you could always do that. Um, it would be pretty cruel of me to like go beyond eight components on the final. Um, so you can decide whether you think I'm cruel or not. I don't know. But um, um, yeah, this template is, is good for an eight ingredient list. Anything, you know, if you're making like a Mexican mole, you're, you got to add a little bit to the template because that's going to have 20 ingredients. So, um, all right. So how do we do this? Um, I tried to make it self-explanatory. You put the underlying price here. You put dividend yield. Oh, let's uh, add an additional thing to my uh, underlying asset. It pays zero dividends. So what did I say the underlying price was? I said it was 30. Notice, uh, I'm, gonna sell, uh, I'm gonna change cell B4 to 30, and look at what happens to C4, D4, E4, yada, yada. So I'm gonna say 30, I push enter, automatically changes everything else. You wanna use the same numbers for all the components because they're all on the same underline. That's why, only change it in one place. My template is changing everything else for you. So far so good? Same thing with dividend yield. No dividends, boom. Volatility I said was 55%, boom. Riskless rate 2%, boom. Maturity one year, oh, we're already good. Now what about this? Well, the strike prices are one of the main things that change column by column. Now, notice this is strike price or face value. So if it's a bond, enter in the face value. If it's an option, you know, call option or CNBC, put the strike price. If it's the underlying, it don't matter. Put whatever you want. I just don't leave it blank. Just don't change the number. It just becomes irrelevant, okay? Um, so what did we have, 10? Let's actually even put the components, let's label them by type. So component one is a bond. Component two is underline. Component three is CNBC. Component four is a call. Component five is another CNBC. And component six is another call. This is just gonna be helpful for me. Um, what about the strike or face value? Well, this is a bond, so it's the face value and it's 10. It's an underlying, so I don't care what this number is. So whatever, I'll make it a big ass number. It don't matter. Whoops, actually, it needs to be an actual number. So I push this minus, minus sign by accident, boom. Um, CNBC, 10. Um, the call option was also 10. The next CNBC was 20. And then the final call was at 20. It's just the strike price of each of the components. Right, that's why I have to change all of those numbers. Folks okay with this so far? We're, we're basically done. Um, all, the, all the math has been done. We just need, need to go through the catalog and pick out the right prices. So the red here is literally our whole, rel it's, like, it's like our catalog. And there's more things in the catalog than what we need. That's why it's useful to look at this. Because for this column, I'm giving you the price of an underline, of a bond, of a call with this strike price, of a put. You'll never need to use the put. I just put it in there just so you know. Um, and of the CNBC. 
So this is a bond. So this is the price, right? This is an, un oh, sorry, I'm sorry. What did I just say? Uh, this is a bond. So this is the price. This is an underlying. So this is the right price. This is a CNBC. So this is the right price. This is a call. So this is the right price. You guys get the picture here? So now I'm ready. I know my catalog. I know how to use it. I can see my recipe. So I know the quantities. So let me go and put the quantities. The quantity here is one. There's just one bond, but it has a face value of 10. Um, 0 0.5 units of the underlying. Again, if you don't remember, you know, I can look back and it's pretty big so I can read it. Um, but if you go back to earlier when, the, when you saw me in big and you could read the stuff in the back, I'm just picking out the numbers that are behind me right now. Um, the CNBC, it was short 10 units, so it's minus 10. What about the call component four? It was short 0.5 units. What about component five? It was long five units because it was a jump of five. And then component six was long one unit, one. So do, you, do we get that these are the quantities in our shopping cart? So then what is the value of our shopping cart? Which this answer is our solution via static replication. It's just quantity times the right price plus quantity times the right price plus quantity times the right price plus quantity oops times the right price this was a call called da, 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 da. plus whoops my bad You don't mind, I'm not going to talk through it anymore. Mm -hmm. And we are done. Well, we have to push enter. We are done. So what is the value of this derivative? The value of this derivative is $20.68. And this is the technique, right? And again, like I want to highlight, like at least for me, once I realized that this was doable, it's like pretty remarkable, like how much stuff we can value using this procedure. And when we really understand what we do, it's also remarkable how simple it actually is, right? Like the basic steps is not rocket science. Well, I guess, I don't know, maybe a physicist will be like, you know, all this rocket shit, it's just like Newton's three laws. Okay, fine, probably. Um, so maybe that's simple too, I don't know. Um, but uh, I'm not that kind of doctor. Um, but this is pretty simple, right? Um, so that, I don't know, like maybe you didn't quite understand in the past when you did stuff like this, how, how basic the logic of it all was, right? Um, but the other thing is we can now price an infinite number of different derivatives now. And we're also going to see that this technique with the piecewise linear with jumps, that we can do a ton of really complicated projects with this as well. And that's what we'll start doing next. Sound good? All right, let's go and start doing that. Mm. Um, you guys see me in big now again? Is that what's happening? Okay, well, I'm now going to start sharing my slides. Now, can everyone see my slides? All right. So, look, as I said, uh, now we start, or we're soon going to start, using the technique of static replication to think about valuing flexibility in a corporate project. Okay? Um, 
And by the way, let me mention one thing. If you look at my lecture notes, both lecture note two, part one, and lecture note two, part two, I actually cover two ways of doing derivative pricing and apply them to corporate projects. The, one, the first one is the one that we've done, static replication. But there's a second one that I call dynamic replication. And dynamic replication doesn't build off of the Black-Scholes model. Instead, uh, it builds off of something called the binomial model, which you may or may not have seen. Uh, but in particular, it does what we call a multi-period binomial model. Um, but I'm not going to be covering that here right now, right? So I just figured it makes more sense, actually, just after I've covered this technique to start talking about applying that technique. Okay, so that's what we're going to be um, uh, doing, again, as I said, partially today. But really, we'll be doing the challenging version of that stuff on, th uh, on Thursday of this week. Sound good? Now, before I start using this technique to solve a quantitative problem, I first want to give us a qualitative understanding of what it means to have flexibility in corporate finance or in a corporate project, right? Because, you know, without understanding that flexibility, it's actually impossible to really model the flexibility and use the approach that we cover uh, or that we, uh, we teach you today. Right. Um, so as a precursor to applying in corporate finance, we want to really think in corporate finance, what are some really important and common forms of flexibility that we see? OK, so I'm going to give you guys a list. It's not a comprehensive list, but I'll give you guys a list of some of the most important kind of cuts on flexibility that um, I think exist in the real world. OK. Um, by the way, just in terms of lingo, when you value a project using these option pricing techniques to get a value of the project, um, a lingo that is sometimes used uh, by both academics and practitioners is to call this real option analysis. Like option as in we're using derivative pricing techniques, right? That's what we did here. Uh, and real as in, these aren't just financial options, these are options on real activity, right? How do you do a project? It's, a, it's something real, it's not something just uh, you know, financial that's kind of money shifting from one person to another, right? Um, and you'll also notice another thing is that the acronym for real option analysis is ROA, which is you know, a little bit unfortunate uh, because you know, it's also ROA is return on assets. So it's always wonderful when a field loves to like double use, you know, sequences of letters for stuff like that. So just know when you see ROA, you know, look, most of the time it's going to be return on asset, but just sometimes it's going to be a uh, real option analysis. Here's a good like uh, rule of thumb. I don't know if uh, I'll get in trouble for saying this, but like if the person presenting ROA to you is an uber nerd, it's probably real options analysis. And if the person presenting to you, uh, it's unclear whether they passed grade eight math. Uh, it's probably a real, uh, uh, return on asset, okay? And anything in between might be a bit more ambiguous. So, um, you know, yeah. So we'll, uh, we'll basically kind of uh, cover, cover uh, the most common uh, use of real option analysis, right? So definitely in practice, when people do real option analysis, as I hinted to before, there's two routes you can go. One is the static replication and one is the dynamic replication. If you look at what gets done in the real world, like static replication has a 90% market share of real world practice. It's by far the more common one. So let's talk about some of these real options, right? Um, and I like to categorize them on a, on a few different cuts. And one cut that I often like to do with categorizing different types of decisions, different types of options and so on and so forth, is the time dimension. And the time dimension that I'll focus on here is I'll make a distinction between options and flexibility that we consider before we launch an investment, and then options that we consider after an investment is launched. Okay. Um, let me start with one example, which is the notion of staged investment. Right? We haven't started investing in the project yet. Right? 
Well, when I'm deciding, I'm the person who's going to make the investment. I'm the one with the money. Okay. Um, and I'm deciding like, how am I going to structure my investment with this, you know, manager that's going to manage the project? Uh, let's say the project go taking it from zero to end costs a hundred million dollars. So like I have some decisions to make. Do I just like send the hundred million right now and let the person roll? Right. That's one option. I could do that. Um, or do I do something else? Like maybe just send them 10 million at first and tell them, come back to me when you're almost done with this 10 million and I'll decide whether I give you more or not. And then if they come back for more and things look good, I give them another 20 million and I say, come back again once you've spent this 20 and then I'll decide whether to give you the rest of the 70. And then, you know, they come back if things look good, give them the rest of the 70, off to the races kind of thing. Right, what I just proposed is called staged investment. So that you don't commit to fully investing the project. Instead, you give it in clumps and you look for milestones to be met, or you look to see how the market develops to see if things still look promising. Right, so that decision of do you stage investment? And if so, how do you stage it? Is a question of you know, deciding you know, how much flexibility you want to preserve in the project, right? Because the more staging I do, the more flexibility I preserve for myself in this, uh, in this project. And we can see one reason why I would want to do that. If I'm worried that this manager sucks, I should be a little bit careful about giving them the 100 million up front. And so if they can prove themselves for $10 million, that's a wonderful thing. Let them prove themselves, then I give them more. Hey, they'll be ultra motivated as well. That's nice too, right? Um, but again, it's not just about the manager. Maybe I already know, look, that manager is hot shit, right? But like, we don't know if this project is good. Maybe something unexpected happens and all of a sudden this project goes from being good to being bad. Right. If this was a project, um, you know, project, you know, build um, uh, cinema, they're probably not, you know, we probably want to shut that down at the moment. You know, maybe we recontinue later on when we get back to the old normal, but in the new normal, no, yeah, no that's pretty crazy. Um, right. So that's reacting. Right. Flexibility there is helpful, too. So generally, the flexibility, it's all about adding value or protecting value, right, in reaction to any news that we receive that is value relevant. Where value relevant stuff includes what does the demand curve for this product look like? What does the cost structure for producing this product look like? How competent is the management? All of this stuff is value relevant news. So we pay attention to it and make our decision in the future conditional on what we learn on those fronts, correct? Right, and what's the, what's the benefit of flexibility? I mean, in some sense, there's a really easy way to explain the benefit of flexibility uh, without any math, right? You know, like the term, uh, um, uh, well, there's the term heads I win, tails you lose. You know, that's, a, that's a gamble that I like, but let's not, uh, that's, that's like pretend land. Um, the thing that I am familiar with is heads I win, tails I lose. It's called a gamble. We do that whenever we invest in a risky asset. Um, well, flexibility tries to create the following. It moves us from heads I win medium, tails I lose medium, to in a world where I use flexibility in a really wonderful way, I can actually get to heads I win mega and tails I lose a little bit. Now, what do you prefer? Heads I win medium, tails I lose medium, or do you prefer heads I win mega and tails I lose a little bit? All of us prefer the latter pretty obviously. That's the benefit of flexibility. That does require me to be competent in using my flexibility. Like if I'm a fool and I successfully, 
successfully transform heads I win medium, uh, tails I lose medium, and I transform that because I make terrible decisions to uh, whatever, heads I win medium, tails I lose historically terrible, then all of a sudden I've managed to destroy value with flexibility, right? This is where the notion of trust or like ability to exercise flexibility well becomes really important in, in adding value and flexibility because it requires you to react in a smart way to the news, the value relevant news that comes in between now and, and the eventual future. Folks okay with this so far? So like, look, if you think you're really good at making judgment calls of do I reinvest or do I stop, then staging might be a good idea. Now, I mean, by the way, it's not unambiguously a good idea. There's always like a bunch of nuanced considerations in the real world, right? Because maybe like, look, if we live in a world like I'm an investor, I'm a VC. VC is like a, a place where we see staged investment almost all the time. You've probably read of startups, you know, raising one round of investment, then raising another, then raising another, then raising another. Like Uber raised like 20 rounds of funding. That's staged investment for you, right? So it's so staged investment, very common in VC. But let's say like there's this really amazing, promising project. You know, I'm a VC. There's, you know, invisible person next to me is another VC. Um, and, um, you know, we're both trying to successfully invest in this project slash startup founder. And I go like, you know, I need to keep flexibility because like, I, because uh, flexibility is valuable. I love it. Um, and so I go to the founder and I'm like, um, here's my offer. This staged investment. I'll give you this much at first and this much after if things go well. And, uh, and then the person gets, you know, invisible person next to me goes and says, giving you the hundred million, baby. Well, I might actually lose the deal because I've been stubborn to want to keep flexibility. Whereas like flexibility that I gain creates problems for the other side in the transaction. You see what I'm saying? And so it's not as simple as saying, always protect your flexibility. Um, you sometimes, uh, need to kind of give that up in order to win a deal or in order to secure a customer, things like that. So you want to be mindful of, oh, by the way, I mean, it's actually pretty random, but like this just happened to me this morning, uh, just before I started my prior class. Uh, last night, I bid on a house. Pretty plain vanilla way. I made an offer above the ask, um, but I included the standard flexibility thing, which is, I kind of want to make uh, an inspection and, make, and decide whether I want to close this based off of whether there are skeletons in the closet. I mean, I didn't even really think that I was doing that. I just kind of take it as given. I'm not buying something for you know, well over a million dollars like, you know, without, without an inspection, okay? Um, guess what? The, per like, the other person that bid against me literally made an offer. I mean, I kid you not, no inspection. Okay, <laughs> so you know, I asked for flexibility, I lost the deal. So actually it's really rather random that, well, no, I'm happy this happened to me. I was able to use it for teaching purposes. I'll tell that to my partner because she's pretty pissed. Um, but um, yeah, um, so, so yeah, I mean, just I mean, these, there's always these little nuances, right? That like we never pick up in a model that we make, right? But it's good to keep these things in mind. So I just, the reason why I mentioned this anecdote is just for you to realize, like, even though I tell you guys, flexibility is valuable, flexibility is valuable. Don't interpret it so naively as to think that in the real world, you always must, under every condition, preserve every flexibility you can, because that can lead to lost opportunity as well. And the example I just gave you is an example of that. Yeah? So, um, so yeah, all right, let's continue. Um, let's see what time, what time does this finish? 12.55, right? Yeah, okay, good. Um, so let's talk about some of the other options. Um, some of the other options uh, include things like timing options. Um, so what's top timing option, right? Uh, well, timing option in the context of before an investment is launched, it's like, look, I have an idea for a project. 
Do I start it now or do I wait and see? Right? That's always an option. You don't need to just do it right now. You could wait. Right? So this question of timing is a hugely important question. Right? And so sometimes that's uh, something you want to consider. Do I want to give up the flexibility of waiting to start at a better time by starting now? Just look more generally, I find it interesting to just think about the design of flexibility, right? Because when you're entertaining a project, there is always way more than one way for you to implement the project. And one dimension that you should think about when you think about your project is, if I do it this way, how much flexibility do I have left? If I do it that way, how much flexibility do I have left? Right? Do I want to protect my flexibility? What are the costs associating, associated with protecting my flexibility? Right? Is it necessary for me to line up that first customer to commit to them that I will provide this product and service for 10 years? If yes, then I probably need to cut my flexibility to just posse out after two years, right? Um, things like that, right? So you want to think like, what are your trade-offs when you're trying to harness flexibility? So I actually think people are really good at systematically both identifying opportunities to keep flexibility and people who have good judgment on understanding that sometimes you wanna give up flexibility because it has real benefits in other ways. For instance, negotiating a lower price with a supplier or convincing a customer to buy. People who have really good judgment around those things can actually add a ton of value to the enterprise. And by the way, a lot of the people who are really good at it aren't necessarily even good at math because some of this stuff is actually more logic and judgment than it is something you can precisely pin down a model, a model-based valuation of. Sound good? All right, let's keep on going over a few other options. Now, these are gonna be options now that happen after you've launched an investment. One is growth options. And I like to think of growth options in two ways, scale options and scope options. The scale option is whatever, like I was talking to one of my ex-students, um, uh, the other day, his name is Jordan Owen. I think he probably graduated like four years ago. You might have actually read about him uh, because if you read over the summer about uh, a, Dizzo, a recent Dizzo Ted grad who started selling face masks during the pandemic, that's him, right? He started the project. I guess I probably shouldn't tell you guys the number that they've sold. They've sold a lot. Um, but they basically scaled up at some point because they placed orders for some of these masks. They saw the demand was like far outstripping what they would thought. So they basically scaled up everything that they were doing. By the way, it was relatively easy for them to scale up because they outsourced production, by the way. Right? So going back to like the notion of um, designing flexibility. Well, when you build your own, you'll probably be able to build at a lower cost, but you're eliminating flexibility because you have this capacity that you kind of need to use. And it's tough for you to scale up it's like once you've built a facility that'll make 100,000 of these a week, it's kind of tough for you to go to 200,000, right? So like build your own, cheaper, but, but, uh, uh, but less flexible versus outsource per unit more expensive, but adjusting becomes easier, right? So they, they preserved flexibility, got a big spike in demand, and were able to adjust their demand upwards. And it's pretty cool. Like, it's, that's done well enough that he's using the profits of that to fund his next venture, which is on what he's actually passionate about, which is AI meets uh, real estate. Okay, so pretty cool stuff. Um, good job, Jordan. Um, but um, that's, a, that's, a that's a growth option, but specifically about scale. There's also growth options that are about scope, right? Um, you know, um, I sell peanut butter. And, and uh, I'm proud of that, uh, sell peanut butter. Uh, and I'm like, oh, wait a second, you know, I've, I've done some uh, customer development uh, by talking to my son and my son tells me he likes peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. So I'm like, oh, scope, okay, well, I'm, I'm, 
I've got like proprietary customer distribution on my peanut butter and most of my customers like jelly. Let me go sell them some jelly too. And you know, might, might as well also throw in some, uh, some, uh, some bread with no crust too. That's a winner, right? That's scope, right? I expand on scope because there's some sensibility to it. Uh, that's another option, right? I didn't need to commit to going and entering in the jam business. Um, at the beginning, I could just go and do the peanut, the peanut butter business. Um, look, the inverse of a growth option is a contraction option. So that's always an option too, right? Um, we also have shutdown options, right? Uh, abandonment options. Um, now you might be like shut down, abandonment, what's, sorry, aren't those things the same? So my point is that there's some nuances in what scaling down to zero means. Sometimes when you scale down to zero, there's no way to reopen. Or sometimes you scale down to zero by just selling off the company, in which case it's also difficult to reopen. And sometimes you shut down, but it can be temporary and you can reopen later. All of these things matter in terms of value and flexibility so that the details matter. Sound good? So this is like a few of the different types of options that exist. And, um, you know, in an ideal version of the world, we can get a little bit comfortable in thinking about how we would model and value various forms of this flexibility. And again, we'll actually touch on an example that has more than one of these elements eventually. And you'll see how it all nicely integrates into one thing, right? Into, into eventually giving us basically a payoff diagram for our project for the cash flows at different points in time. And then, you know, doing our replication stuff. Done. Uh, so that's what we're going to start doing now. Um, we will start with the simplest possible example, literally the simplest thing I could think of. Um, that's the only example that we're going to do today. And then I'm going to have two examples left. Um, one is going to be a, a very elaborate version of the simple example we do today. I mean, not exactly the same company, but you know, elaborate in spirit. Um, and then another one is going to be also a simple one like today, but where, um, where the distance between theory and practice is larger. So like the example we do today is what I'm going to be calling a clean real option analysis. What I mean is like, it's, it's kind of planet Earth. Um, and so it's going to be useful to think about that when we see these examples. Like, am I giving you an example that like you think is believable in the real world versus like, is this more planet McGill? So that like, we should only view this like as a, as a signal, but not as a real like, you know, light post on our decision. Right, so that we should take it with a huge grain of salt instead of a medium grain of salt. Sound good? Let's go ahead and do that. So this is gonna be our simple first example and I do even label it here. I say clean. So clean means like, this is about as close as you can get to being something that you would actually do believably in the real world. So that this one is kind of planet Earth. Okay? Um, and in particular, the example we're doing is um, an example from natural resources extraction. In particular, we're going to value an oil lease. So let me read the setting, and then we'll solve the problem. Sound good? And you'll see, we're going to solve the problem. It's going to be like an easy version of static replication. The thing that's easy about this is that this is a super simple project. And the example we do next lecture, I mean, it's still going to be a pretty simple project, but what you'll see is the complexity of the payoff diagram gets, gets messy in a hurry. So that this is like the simplicity of this proje project here is non-representative of the real world, but there are the occasional projects like this where it is simple. Okay? So, we are an energy firm called Master Drilling Company, or MDC. And we're considering 
the purchase of an oil lease. So we haven't purchased it yet. We're just considering it. And in order to purchase the oil lease, we need to pay $450,000. The lease provides our company with the opportunity to develop oil reserves on a specified piece of property during the next year. And we'll just assume for simplicity, when I say next year, we can only do it at the end of the year, right? So that if we end up drilling, we drill in a year, okay? Because this lease is on property adjacent to an already producing oil field, MDC's geologists are very confident about the quality of oil, or sorry, not quality, probably quality too. I guess there's probably variation there, but I'm really talking quantity here. Uh, quantity of oil that will be produced on the property. Consequently, the primary concern of MDC's management relates to the price at which the oil they may extract would be sold. And it gets sold in a year, so it's really concerns about oil prices in one year. So far, so good? By the way, something you guys might not know, and that's the reason why I gave a shout out to the geologists here. Did you guys know like people like finish a master's program in geology and who have the competency to be a geologist for stuff like that? They get paid like 300K US dollars right out of their master's program. So I don't know if you guys want to like switch your career tracks or something. Some of you guys are going and dropping right now. Um, yeah, yeah, it's like literally like those are the master, like I was talking to someone at Stanford and like those are the master's students that have the highest average salary out of their master's program bar none. Now, okay, I had this conversation several years ago when oil prices were higher. So who knows, you know, while prices lower, you know, is this gonna continue? Probably not. I'm, I wonder what they were thinking about their career prospects when, not sure if you guys paid attention to oil prices over the summer, but there was some real crazy shit. What, can you hear me? No, okay, well, anyway. Um, so anyway, I thought, I don't know why I told you that. Um, so no, I think it's fine. I was surprised when I heard it, but good for them, fabulous. Um, Maybe they're the people who bid against me and are like, I've got so much money, I'm willing to pay, you know, 1.3 without an inspection. Um, fuckers, okay, come on. Um, all right, so keep on uh, reading this thing. Um, so let's suppose that MDC must spend $300,000 at time zero in addition to the $450,000 to develop the property in preparation to extract oil in one year. So in other words, they're spending $750,000 at time zero. So far, so good? Um, MDC has the right to produce 100,000 barrels of oil, and they know to extract the oil, they kind of have to pay roughly $45 per barrel. Like oil companies, they know how much it costs to get the oil out on a, on a marginal basis. So 45 per. Uh, if it was oil sands, it would be way higher than that. Um, so this is obviously not in Alberta. Um, MDC sells the oil at prevailing market price. And when I say prevailing market price, it's prevailing market price when they take the oil out. So at, in one year. So far, so good? So given this information, we are going to use this verbal description of the project to get a payoff diagram for the project. And then once we have a payoff diagram for the project, we will use static replication to figure out the value of the project. Sound good? All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing my slide now and I'm gonna solve and talk through this problem on uh, the board behind me, right? Um, so look, I mean, if you're viewing this video afterwards and can pause and do all that stuff that you can't do if you're sitting here right now, unfortunately, um, you know, you might find it useful to pause sometimes and just look at my slides if you start like not understanding why I use a certain number because you kind of need to remember them. I wrote the problem so I can remember it. Sound good? All right, so I'm gonna stop the share here. You guys can all see me again? All right.
Okay. So as I said, we're going to do a payoff diagram. Um, look, the, the reason why this is the first exercise I do is because the payoff diagram is as simple as it gets, right? So payoff diagram for project. And what I really mean by this, right, the payoff, well, first of all, there's cash flows at time zero and cash flows at time one in this project, correct? So the payoff diagram is for the cash flow at time one because it's the cash flow at time one that I'm not sure yet what the number is going to be. Are we okay with that? So Y axis here is gonna be cash flow at time one. And the X axis is going to be oil price at time one. So far, so good. And of course, we also know there's a cash flow at time zero for this project. What's the cash flow at time zero? I think it was negative 450,000, but I'm not sure. So that was, the, that was the lease, but were there other things? There was a, you know, getting things set up to extract the oil, 300,000. So we have, minus 450 minus another 300 so minus 750,000 okay so cash flow at time zero is minus 750,000 dollars now let's focus on the cash flows at time one um if oil sells for 15 bucks a barrel what does mdc do do they drill or do they not drill They, they don't drill. Yeah. Sorry? Um, they don't drill. They don't drill, right? They would lose money. Be, I mean, unless you're like spending your enemy's money, you're not going to pay 45 bucks for something you can sell for 15, right? So for any oil price below 45, you don't drill. Don't drill. And when you don't drill, there's no... Oil, there's no barrels of oil to sell. You get nothing. You, well, you get nothing and you lost 750 before. So far, so good? The moment you can sell for more than 45 bucks, right? Um, you drill, baby, drill. Right? So drill, baby, drill. Drill, baby, drill. And then what, 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 what do you get as a payoff? For every dollar above 45, you earn that extra dollar 100,000 times because it's 100,000 barrels. In other words, it's a straight line with a slope of 100,000. Slope equals 100,000. That's it. This is our payoff diagram. This is the flavor profile of this project, right? And now we just need to replicate. So remember, we use four types of ingredients, zero, riskless zero coupon bond, underlying, call options, and CNBCs. Do we use any riskless zero coupon bond? No, because the intercept is zero. Do we use any underline? No, because the original slope is zero. Do we uh, use any CNBCs? No, because there's no jumps or drops. Do we use any call options? Yes, but we only use one because there's only a change in slope in one place. So we go long 100,000 units of call on um, oil with a strike price of 45 and a maturity equal to one year. And we're done. You know, this is kind of like, we were talking about the dish. It's kind of like if I went to a restaurant and I ordered salt, 
they bring it to me. I taste it. I'm like, ooh, pleasant. How do I make this at my home? Salt. Done. Okay? So that's that. Uh, that's why this is as, about as easy as you get, right? Um, maybe it sounds fancier if I use the word in French, said. I don't know. I wonder how you say it in Japanese. Mm, I should know that. I'm half Japanese, but I don't. Um, okay. Um, so what's the last thing that we need to do? We need to now price the shopping cart, which requires us just to know what? To know the price of a call on oil with strike price 45 and one year to maturity. Now remember before I said, hey, why don't we just uh, go figure out what the spot price of oil is, what the volatility of oil prices are, let's get the riskless rate, and then we can use the Black-Scholes model. Actually, you don't even need to do that here. You know why you don't need to do it? It already exists in the market. That's at 100%, that's the perfect answer. It's because this thing is already traded. Why do I need to use the Black Scholes model, no matter how easy it is with that little dinky spreadsheet, when you can open up the Wall Street Journal and literally look up that price? Or whatever, Bloomberg Terminal, you know, your favorite you know, feed into like, loosely speaking, real-time market data, right? This thing is actually traded, right? Like the, the nice thing about Black Scholes is that it allows you to get hypothetical prices without the things trading. But morning, noon, and night, when you can get the real price from the market, do that. Don't use the Black-Scholes model. Because the Black-Scholes model is a model. It is not perfect. It makes assumptions that are not perfectly realistic. So you use the Black-Scholes model when you need to. But if you've got the actual price, use the actual price. Here you have the actual price. So, so you're actually doing a really good job. So let's say you dig up the price, and the price is $1.850 per, per single call option. Then in that case, what is the value of this project? Well, the value of this present value of cash flow one is what? Well, it's a thousand times 850, correct? So 1,000, or 100,000 times 850, which is $850,000. So now, does this project look good or bad to you? So, yeah, so Ashley is saying that it looks good. Why does it look good, Ashley? Because uh, it's more than 750000 which is your initial cost. Exactly, right? So what is the real option value? Let's call it the ROA. It's equal to cash flow zero plus present value of cash flow one minus 750 plus 850 equals 100,000. Cha-ching, bigger than zero. By the way, some of you guys might think, but wait a second, Jiro, this happens at time one. Why didn't you take this number and discount it by a year? The reason is discounting was already done into getting this number because you have to pay this number today. <coughs> so no, no discounting. You do not, like, some people think because they see PV, everyone, they need to take this number and divide it by one plus some are, do not do that ever. When you're using those prices, discounting has already been done for you. Like the hard work was actually done either by the market when you got the market price or by Black Shoals. Hallelujah, you know, why not? I'll let someone else do that work for me. Um, so yeah, I mean, basically, you know, hey, if you can get something worth, that's worth 850,000, for 750,000, you want to do that. You want to ask, and then you start saying like, hey, what other, what, other, uh, what other leases can I buy in the neighborhood? You know, location, 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 right? Um, so, um, so yeah, that's basically this example. Um, so as I said, I have two more examples in my notes that are about static replication. 
Uh, one is like a way more elaborate version of something in, the, in this spirit, which gives you a sense of how um, intricate this can get um, when you do this in the real world. Because you'll see, I'm gonna describe a project to you that seems totally sensible. It doesn't seem contrived in any way, shape or form. And then you'll see like, whoa, the payoff diagram is gonna be way messier than that. Um, and, and that'll point you to in the real world what the real challenge is. It's actually to make sense of the project and translate the project into a payoff diagram. That's the real work. And hopefully what I showed you with our examples so far, especially the algorithm for doing replication of a, a piecewise linear with jumps, that it's like so formulaic that once you've taught yourself how to do it, it's pretty procedural. So that like in the real world, your focus and attention is really at the first part, really understand the project and translate it into a payoff diagram. And then every other part is like warm knife through butter once you've had enough practice. Right? And then we'll do another example that's uh, you know, a little bit less complicated as a payoff diagram, but where it's a much dirtier application of, um, of static replication. And so there it will be about understanding like when are you in planet McGill and when are you in planet Earth or where do you fall in between kind of thing. So that's th those are the things that we're going to do on uh, Thursday. Sound good? All right. I think we're good for today. I hope everyone has a nice uh, next couple of days. Take care, all.